there's a term you're familiar with that refers to events that do not take place very often. That term is once in a blue moon. I'm not sure the exact calibration of how many days or months that is between, or years, between blue moons. But once in a blue moon, our pastor is away from his pulpit two consecutive Sundays. In fact, I can't remember the last blue moon or the last time our pastor was away. And uh, it just so happened that the schedule worked its way in a manner that uh, the first week he was gone, uh, and then the second week uh, is communion, which came out on the calendar. We switch every other month, and so it was my opportunity. So it worked out well f- all the way around for everyone but you, and that is you didn't get to start with John's Gospel today. Get back into John's Gospel. We'll be back, Lord willing, next week. So the redeeming value is we do remember the Lord today. Uh, last week, for those of you who were here and remember, we considered the truth that a Christian's happiness, their joy, uh, their contentment is associated with their fellowship or their communion with God, their walk daily with God. And we saw that that fellowship can be broken when a Christian willingly sins against God or sins against a brother or a sister. And in that disobedience, they continue to live out their life. And when that occurs, uh, we can escape uh, our disfellowship from the one that we've offended just by not going around them, but we can't escape our fellowship or our broken fellowship with God. And so we saw that illustrated in the lives of some of the individuals in the church at Corinth who had uh, serious uh, cases of disobedience, not only toward God and His Word, but also against their brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we considered Paul's instruction to them uh, to take an objective look <clears throat> at their lives at a particular point in time, and that was when they gathered around the Lord's table. And it could be that they did that on a weekly basis. And so he encouraged them to take an objective look at their lives, to identify sin unconfessed, whether it was attitude or action, so that they could then come and in a manner worthy of what they were celebrating, uh, celebrate as a corporate body uh, the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ on their, their behalf. I closed with the challenge that maybe it would be a good thing if we would do the same, that we would spend our week uh, remembering that admonition and that we would keep short accounts with those that we might offend or sin against, asking for forgiveness, making restitution if necessary, and then to keep short accounts with God because God says that A true Christian, the mark of a Christian, is that they confess their sins. And when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's that's a verse not to lead someone to the Lord. That's a verse to put into the heart of a child of God so that we might maintain daily, regular fellowship and communion with God. Monday morning... Mrs. B and I were uh, reading our Bibles and getting ready to pray. She said, uh, can I ask you a question about yesterday's sermon? And I said, uh, sure. She said, is it possible to be in fellowship with God, to be in fellowship with my fellow brothers and sisters in the faith, to have a short account with all, and at the same time not have that joy, that happiness, that rejoicing that you talked about. Is it possible for a a child of God who is in fellowship and communion with God and others not to be sad? I 
I felt like I needed an answer. And so I thought to myself, now that's a good question. I wish I'd asked it yesterday. It's very thoughtful. Can, it, can a Christian be sad? If it's not a consequence of sin, if it's not a consequence of broken fellowship, the answer to the question is uh, y- yes and no. Don't you like that kind of answer? Yes or no. Yes, in this instance, no in that. We will have sorrows in this life, in this world. There will be things that no matter what our spiritual conditions is, that our hearts will be grieved. Listen to the words of a Savior. Let me just read them. To you, you trust me that I'm not reading from Reader's Digest, okay? This is from John's Gospel, chapter 16. I won't stay here and preach Pastor Ben's sermon two years from now. John chapter 16, verse 20, prior to his, just hours prior to his crucifixion, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament and the world shall rejoice. Let your sorrow, uh, and be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born unto her. Ye now therefore have sorrow, But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. The events of the next 48 hours are going to bring you great grief. You're going to be sad. But you'll have joy. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, this church that we just spoke about, he talked to them about his own sorrow. And he says in the second chapter, verse 3, I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come, I should have sorrow. I wrote this letter because I didn't want to be sorrowful, sad in the inward myth when I came to see you. I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. I don't want to be sad when I see you. I should be glad. Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. So sorrow can come from a a multitude of sources. Not always Sinful sources, not always disobedient. But having said that, we can't let those sorrows overwhelm us. We cannot let those sorrows ever bring us to a point to where we're rendered incapable of having a joyful, rejoicing heart. Well, how can that be? How can you have coexisting sorrow and joy. Well, the way that happens is because of what the Lord says. He says, you're going to see me again. And when you see me again, then you're going to have joy. Do you remember Luke's rendering of when those two disciples walked on the Emmaus road and they were walking along talking about the sorrow and the tragedy the one that they had hoped would be the prophet and etc etc and the Lord came alongside them and they didn't recognize the Lord because their eyes were holden that they should not know him and as they walked it says that God Christ opened their eyes so that they realized that they were walking with the very one that they thought they had lost And all of a sudden, things changed in their demeanor. 
what they had been grieving and complaining, the words indicate that they were murmuring. They weren't happy. The one they thought was going to be their Savior was gone. They weren't happy. And then he came. And it says, did our hearts not burn within us? And you, you go on to read about when he came into the midst of all of the disciples. He stood in the midst of them and he said, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why are your thoughts arise in your heart? Behold, my hands, my feet. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed, not for joy. They didn't believe it was him because they were so joyful. They were so excited at what they were seeing. They were, but they didn't fully apprehend. My point is that when their focus was on the Christ, their joy was present. So can you be in harmony and in fellowship with God and have sorrow about something that's going on over here? Maybe closely associated with you, a loved one or something like that. Can you? The answer would have to be yes. But you cannot let that rob you and overcome you so that you go about your business with a defeated, downcast mindset. You say, well, how, how, what, what, what are we supposed to do? Well, what we're supposed to do is to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You say, well, what are we supposed to be looking at? What are we supposed to be looking for? Well, it would be kind of foolish for me to say everything, but I'm going to say it anyway. We should know as much as humanly possible about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more you know about him, the greater the joy. I've met young people who know a whole lot about video games. I've met people who know a lot about baseball and baseball players and their batting average. I know people who know a lot about, you name it. How many people can you say you personally know that when you are in their presence you know they know the Lord Jesus Christ you just know they know wouldn't you like to be in that crowd that people just oh that gal that guy they have a close affinity and relationship with their Savior, the Lord Jesus. I, I, I'd like to, you know. Enoch walked with God. Abraham uh, believed God. Uh, the servant in the temple uh, uh, praised God and served God. Uh, how would you like to be known? I'd like to be known as someone who understands that he's been justified by Jesus Christ. We sang a very articulate hymn about our justification. Pastor Ben read for us off the flyleaf of our bulletin a very articulate man's declaration about justification. What do you understand about being justified through Jesus Christ? 
I mean, we're preparing to receive the elements that are associated with our justification. How about I start where I start with myself, first grade. His robes were mine, high school, college, Bridges, seminary, Martin, first grade, kindergarten. What does it mean to be justified? Well, first I have to understand that there are three tenses in my salvation. Okay? In the future, I will be glorified. Okay? That happens when I am fully removed from the power and the presence of sin. You say, is that when you go off to the ocean by yourself? No. That doesn't happen until I go to heaven. Future. Then there's the right now present tense. Right now, I'm being sanctified. Sanctified is not the same as justified. Different word. I'm living daily less, I pray, and less and less under sin's power and sin's practice. I'm being changed into the image, the character, the actions of God's Son. Sometimes baby steps, sometimes no steps, but always moving forward. So I have the future when I will be glorified. I have the present when I am being sanctified, but there is a past tense. It's already happened, Pastor alluded to this. That is my justification. Now that's critical to understand justification is critical to my happiness. It, it is, I mean, you leave it out of the mix and you miss a lot. You've heard me tell you about a man who made the world's best cookies, chocolate chip. He used to make them by the tub and bring them to camp. And oh, they were good. Oh, give us the, give us the recipe, give us the recipe. He'd never give anyone the recipe. And they thought, okay, I'll give you the recipe. And people started making them, but you know, they never tasted like his. You know why? He didn't tell them all the recipe. <laughs> he didn't tell them that you use pure, unadulterated butter. And so people were using oil and they were using margin and naturally margin in oil doesn't make the same peanut butter, I mean a chocolate chip cookie as pure butter. It just adds something. Have you found that to be true? You haven't found that to be true. Pure butter adds something to a baked potato that sour cream could never add. It adds something to a homemade biscuit that you couldn't get from the best jam. I say that to say this. If you don't personally, without reading someone or listening to someone, if you don't personally, be, if you can't sit down and work through in your own little mind, my little, your big mind, my little mind, the fact of your justification, you're missing out on one big major ingredient. As Pastor said, this is not to be confused. Justification is not to be confused with God making a person righteous in their actions and attitudes. That, that's sanctification. Justification is God's declaration that that guilty, sinful sinner has been made innocent. He's made innocent. Have you ever been vindicated of an accusation? You said, I sure have. Boy, was I glad. Have you ever been vindicated of something that you did? You were truly guilty of? Justification comes in the midst of a passage that says, 
For all have sinned. All. Parentheses, parentheses. All. Nothing over there. Nothing over there. Not you, not you, not you, not you, not you, not me. We all have sinned. Justification says that God is willing to declare me not a sinner. I wish Lori were here. I could at least get an agreement out of her. Does it do anything for you to think in your mind, knowing what you know about yourself, that the eternal holy God says about you, not a sinner? That's not all. Not only does he say you're innocent, but he moves into your account that he has in glory, in heaven. He moves into your account all of the righteousness of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I know I shouldn't expect it. So I'll just expected of myself. Wow. Or as they say in my part of the country, wowzer. He declares me not guilty. He provides for me all of the righteousness. All of the meeting of the obligations to God and to man he gives to me. I've met them. Just like Jesus met them. Here, here's a verse that if you got a pencil and you don't have it down anywhere, write it on your palm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he, the he is God. For God hath made him, that's his son, his only begotten son. For God hath made his only begotten sin, the son sin for us. The reference there is to the penalty of sin. God put on his son, Isaiah said, all of our sin, who knew no sin. God sin, God's son knew no sin. God put the penalty for all that sin on him. My sin, your sin. He did that in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Memorize that, my dear friend. That's a key to happiness. When the accuser comes to accuse, you just simply say, no, no thank you. I've been made by God, the righteousness of Christ. And when he sees me, he sees that righteousness. As humans, sometimes all we see is the bad in people. You know, we look, ah, then, ah. Isn't it wonderful to know that in Christ he sees only righteousness? The righteousness of his son. I don't know how accurate the illustration is. I, I saw it in a couple of sermons and I tried to research it and so just take it and put it on the side and say maybe, maybe. But the story is about a man who owned a Rolls Royce back in the 70s or so early on and he took that Rolls Royce on a trip out of country. And while he was out of country that Rolls Royce broke down. And he called and he said my car's broke down and I need a mechanic to come and fix it because not just anyone and his uncle works on a Rolls Royce. So the Rolls-Royce company put a man in an airplane with his tools, flew to that country, fixed it, brought it up to brand new, and the man, the mechanic, left. The guy said, I guess I'll be getting a bill here any time. He didn't get a bill. And he didn't get a bill, and he didn't get a bill. Finally, he said, I'm going to contact him. I don't want that thing sneaking up on me. So he called Rolls. 
And they said, uh, Mr., and I'll make the name up, I don't remember what the name was, Mr. Schwartz, uh, yes, we see you on the rolls, but we don't have any record of your rolls breaking down. Don't you know, sir, our cars don't break down. They never have a mechanical problem. Click. How's that? Satan says, look at old Martin. Well, look at that. He, you see the way he kicked that dog? Yelled at his kids. My intercessor makes intercession, and God said, well, that's, that's Martin clothed in the righteousness of my son. I kind of like that when I'm dealing with God, don't you? So, you understand what justification is? All of your sins, not washed away. It's like you never sinned. It never happened. And the righteousness of his son is imputed to you. If you like that, it would be good to understand how it came. You say, we're going to turn in our Bibles anywhere? Yeah, turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Verse 21. Just take the icing on the cake as we read, okay? Just take what you understand. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. So everything that God requires through His law, all of our obligations to man, all of our obligations to Him, all of our obligations to one another, all of those which are His righteousness, they're manifested. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith. So we're asking ourselves, how are we going to get this position, this placement of justification? And Paul tells us, well, it's going to be by faith. You say, yeah, but it's the faith of Jesus Christ. Yes, it is the faith of Jesus Christ. And that could be the faithfulness of Jesus Christ in going to the cross. Or it could be the faith that he gave to us through his word. Either way, it works. It comes through faith. Upon unto all and upon all them that, what's the next word? Believe. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are justified. How? Freely. Freely. Freely means a gift given without cause or merit. A gift that is given without a cause or without merit. In other words, God gives us that position of being justified freely. No merit of my own, the songwriter said. It is a gift. You, you know, Christmas will roll around or birthdays will roll around or something will roll around. You say, well, they got me something. I've got to get them something. Is that the way 90% of gift giving is in the society around it? I got, but just to see... This morning, uh, little Huddy come. Uh, I think I may have been the second stop on, the, on his, his visit here. He came into my office, reached into his pocket, and whipped out a shell from the shore of South Carolina. Freely, he collected that. Well, he said, my, my Gigi really collected it, found it. But she gave it to me, and I'm going to give it to you. I started to ask him, did your mama tell you to do this? Did you tell him to do that? He did it freely. Did dad, did you tell him to do it? No. He did it freely. Did, does that remember, does that bring to your remembrance that little verse in Ephesians chapter 2? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
salvation and all of its accompanying blessings come freely. It isn't a matter of us being good enough, working hard enough, waiting long enough. It means rather that we believe what God has said. Verse 24 in Romans says, through the redemption that is in Christ. This word redemption means to purchase by the payment of a price. Jesus Christ paid the payment that God required, the shedding of blood, that we might have justification. Verse 25, through faith in His blood. You ought to have a little teeny bit of an idea of what justification is. You ought to have a little teeny bit of understanding of how you get it. I hope you get that one the best. It comes by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But what are the daily practical implications of our justification? The bulletin says our sermon title is Justification and the Christian's Joy. Turn over to Romans chapter 5, if you would, as we bring this to a conclusion. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and, what's the next word? Rejoice. In that we are justified, we rejoice in hope. What hope? Why, it's the hope of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? That I'm going to be in His presence forever someday. So when some event comes your way and it burdens you down, you sit down and open your Bible to Romans chapter 5 and you say, you know, self, this is sorrowful, this is sad. But... This is not the way it's going to be, always. I can rejoice in the confident assurance that I have of the glory of God. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. I don't know what's going to happen there. But I know this. I'll spend forever with Him, free from all of that. That's not a bad benefit, is it? Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory, we rejoice in tribulation. We're justified, we rejoice in hope, and we glory, we rejoice in tribulation. Oh, we do? I mean, we do. I look on the faces of those of you that I know well. And I know of some of the tribulations that you faced. Young people, if I might say this kindly, you think you have it tough? You ain't seen nothing yet if you live to be an elderly person. You ain't seen nothing. But did you know that you can rejoice in everything you see? Because every time you face a difficult time, you just know that God's doing what? He's building into you the character of His only begotten Son. That's what it says. Knowing that tribulation works patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope makes us unashamed, bold, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. So a benefit of being justified is I can rejoice in the hope of glory. I can glory or rejoice in tribulations. And finally, verse 11, 
And not only so, but we also joy, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That word there is atonement is a little, a little deceiving if you're not careful, if you just let it sit there. If you look at it, it means we have received the exchange. We sang about that, didn't we? Didn't we? Did you? Pastor Ben, did you sing? You sang about it. You let the song. What did we exchange? His robes for mine. My Bible says that even my righteousness was as filthy rags. And he sent his son to die so that his son could exchange his righteousness for my filthiness. Not because I was worthy. Not because I merited it. But because he loved me. And if I had been the only one who believed, he would still have loved me and had given his son for my sin. So, the question, the, the good question that Mrs. B asked me, can you be sorrowful and sad and at the same time be in communion and fellowship? Yeah, but you can't let it get down and you can't let it overrule you today. Because what we have here overcomes all sorrows. It comes, overcomes all tragedies. Our justification. I like the way one writer put it. He said, don't forget God saved you from something. Condemnation. Hell. That he saved you by someone. His only begotten perfect son. And he saved you for something. And it isn't to walk around with a long face all the time. He saved us that we might joy in God through Christ Jesus. When Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he wrote from prison. He wrote where he was being treated in a manner so that people were trying to make things really rough on him. They were trying to make things tough so that he would be physically mistreated in every way. In the midst of that, there was a problem that he heard about in the church at Philippi. And his response to them in the fourth chapter was this. Rejoice always. And again I say rejoice. I say to Martin this afternoon, rejoice always. And rejoice. For we have been justified. We have been and are being sanctified. And someday we will be glorified. Kind Father, thank you for your wonderful love to us. Help us. Oh God, help us. To learn more and more and more and more. About this wonderful salvation granted to us. Help us not lightly come to this meeting and receive these elements in a manner that's not worthy of justified, sanctified, to be glorified saints. And we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We will glory in your name and in your son's name. Amen.